to the first IMSA Consortium Distinguished Lecture. IMSAC, what we call the consortium, is one of the main ventures of IMSA, and it has become an even more important outreach mechanism in our new world. To say a few more words about the consortium and its importance, I'm very pleased to introduce the person who brought the idea to me originally, Professor Ernesto Lupercio of Simvastov. Ernesto, thank you for your insight and vision, and welcome. Well, thank you very much for the words, but of course, uh, IMSA uh, both has been uh, so far very, very important to many, especially young mathematicians in the Americas uh, and in Latin America, particularly. And also, it could not exist at all without the uh, infinite energy and considerable talents of Professor Cantrell. So, yes, IMSA uh, is uh, uh, well, an extraordinary venture that uh, brings together uh, something that should have been natural uh, from a long time ago, and that shares a lot of uh, the spirit with what uh, ICTP has been doing now for decades. Uh, that is to bring together North and South in the universal language of mathematics. Uh, but it was very natural in particular, and especially uh, at the location of Miami, uh, and considering also the, the long-term plans of the president of the University of, of Miami, um, uh, Julio Frank, that uh, there should be uh, an institution, uh, an established institution with uh, long-term ambitious programs to integrate the mathematics of uh, the old continental mathematics from north to south. And indeed, IMSA has created collaborations going from all the way south, from Argentina, Chile, and certainly, especially uh, uh, Mexico, that is uh, a country that in many ways represented the consortium. and. Uh, and uh, although the pandemic, uh, the timing of the opening of IMSA was almost uh, in a step with the pandemic, uh, even with these ex enormous challenges, uh, IMSA has been very successful in, in creating collaborations and in changing the mathematical lives of uh, young mathematicians in the Americas that through the activities, both in Miami and elsewhere, and the postdoctoral programs and many other things, uh, uh, especially in these uh, um, impossibly challenging times for mathematics in Latin America, where scientific budgets have evaporated, um, well, IMSA has been uh, a crucial a crucial institution for many real people, real mathematicians uh, in, in all these countries, and especially Mexico. So uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, uh, sharing this floor with Professor Cantrell, and now uh, Professor Philip Griffiths, uh, part of the board of, of IMSA. And it is a pleasure to have uh, many people from Latin America connecting now to listen to the probably extremely interesting lectures of uh, the great uh, Don Seguir. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Professor Griffiths to introduce the speaker for this morning. I will look it up. Thank you, Steve. It is a great pleasure to introduce Don Saige, the first in the EMSA's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, Don is one of the leading mathematicians of our time. His broad interest okay, includes in number theory, low dimensional topology, and algebraic geometry. In number theory, 
Together with the crows, they prove a special case of the famous Leonard Bergman's Leonard and Dyer conjecture, one of the millennium uh, problems. In Lowell's dimensional topology, together with John Haar, they calculated the orbital the Euler characteristic of the moduli space of curves, table curves of human species. Beautiful formula involving the zeta function. On a personal note, some years ago at the Abel Centennial, I was giving a talk in which I mentioned a special function. Uh, and I should mention that Don is uh, an absolute expert in special functions. I mentioned a particular special function that arose out of Abel's work. Don was in the audience and asked if I knew the functional equation. And I said, no. And if you don't, nobody does. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Don Saigier, who will speak on two of his laws. The title of his talk is From Knots to Number Theory. So should I start or no? So thank you very much, all three of you, for the introduction. I'm very excited about this possibility, about the new institute. As Ernesto said, the aims of IMSA are somehow very, very similar to those of the ICTP that has existed now for, I think, 60 years that I've been connected with for uh, seven, which is to both do science at a high level, but also make, it, make communication between various countries, various continents, and especially poorer countries or people who cannot travel as easily to main centers to encourage that to do everything possible uh, in, in both directions, and it's very exciting at ICTP to be connected with that, and of course I was really happy that there's such an initiative now for the Americas. So I will start, as you know, this is one of two lectures, and as I prepared I realized I'm going to split it a little. Today will be mostly earlier work. I wrote in the abstract that I will talk about ongoing work with Stavros Garofalidis, whose name I'll write on the board very soon because it's a little long. But in fact, today I'll talk mostly about earlier things and about where the whole story comes from. So I'll use the board, and I hope everything will be visible. And then my handwriting is actually. So the title is from Knots. Number theory. Right. And already this title is supposed to be surprising, or at least it was very surprising to me in the course of the last 20 years. I'm beginning to get used to it. There doesn't seem to be really any connection. One is pure topology, and one is obviously number theory. I'm more of a number uh, practical person than a number theorist. So for me, uh, for instance, one of the knots, which I'll draw in a second, is called 4-1, and it's going to lead to some actual numbers like 1, 11, 697 over 2, or maybe another sequence, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 47 over 24, if I remember correct. Maybe it's 12. Ah, my memory is abandoning me. Uh, so there are actual numbers. But of course, number theory is much more than just numbers. There's theory as well. So there are fancy things like algebraic number theory, so number fields and related things. Number fields, related things might be Dedekind zeta functions uh, and such things. But there are also even fancier things like algebraic K theory. And finally, there's the field which, as Philip said, is uh, I love special functions, and especially the ones that go back to the 19th century and are connected with number theory. With Excuse functions. me, oh? the, the screen is not seen uh, as a big screen. It is only oh, a small I was, screen. I was told that it should be visible. Is it? Yes, it is visible, but only as a small. Uh, it, is, it is probably your connection. I see it large. It's really? probably because ah, your bandwidth is small. Well, okay, right now. I should try again. Right now, I don't um, see excuse it. Excuse me oh. if I intervene. You need to exit the gallery mode. It's the problem is on your side. Although right now I don't see it either. Oh, now I see it. By the way, 
Thank you for asking a question I forgot to say. None of you have been muted. If you want to speak, just switch on your microphone and ask a question. Don't send me emails by chat because I can't read them, but feel free to interrupt. I mean, that's what a semi-live lecture is supposed to be. So can you hear now? Can you see? Yes, we can. Very well. Very clear. Yes. If you couldn't hear, you wouldn't have heard that question, so it wasn't very logical. OK, so I was reminding that on the side of number theory, we have both numbers. But we have fancy things like algebraic number theory, zeta functions, and the like, which I'll come to very soon. But we also have things like k-theory. And above all, I would say my favorite is modular forms, which will play some role today in the background and a lot of role on Friday. So in the continuation of the second lecture, I'll talk only about the recent work. Well, recent, it's over the last six or seven years. It, it's a big ongoing project with Garofalidis, only briefly today, but modular forms will become, or rather new kinds of modular forms will enter. But on the left, we have knots, and knots is pure topology. And by the way, I should say that you know, one of the beautiful things in mathematics for everybody who loves mathematics is that different fields uh, sometimes interconnect, but often they don't, and you have to be very specialized. But this interconnects with everything, so there will be analysis, not too much in the lectures because of lack of time, but there's a lot of asymptotic analysis, some complex analysis. Uh, there will be implicitly some representation theory, although that will be much in the background. Uh, there's certainly uh, quite a bit of pure algebra, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just these two fields, but for the moment, let's think of that. So I remind you what a knot is. I think everyone knows what a knot is even non-mathematicians, you draw a picture of a, a circle. Well, except that human, I mean, normal human beings who aren't mathematicians, a knot has two, has two ends. But for mathematicians, it should be a closed curve, which is somehow embedded in three space in such a way that you can't untie it. So the simplest ones are uh, this one, uh, what did I already did something wrong? Huh? This is supposed to work, but it didn't. This is under, so here it's supposed to go over. There we go. And now this will go over, and then it goes under. It doesn't matter. I'll never use these pictures again. I just want to show that I can do it. But actually, I can't do it. I'm going to talk. There are many knots, and these strange names, 314152 minus 237, they come from various collections, atlases of knots. This means in the list of all knots that need at least four crossings. This is the first one, but there might be more. This is the second one. This is the first, actually the only one. This is called the trefoil knot. This is called the figure eight. This, I think, has a name that I've forgotten. This is the minus 237 pretzel. And if I were a real topologist, I could draw pictures, but I'm not, and I can't. So these knots are specific things. And when I talk about topology, of course, this is a perfectly good manifold, but it's a one-dimensional manifold, and they're all kind of diffeomorphic. So what one means is the topology of the three-manifold, the knot sits in the three-sphere in S3, and you take the complement, and that's an open three-manifold. So it's three-dimensional topology. But one of the beautiful things, actually very beautiful for me since I'm not a good topologist, although I started as, as a topologist, but never a good one, is that the topology goes away almost immediately. What we'll actually be talking about is that these knots have various invariants, and in particular, what are called quantum invariants. I won't explain why they're called quantum invariants, but their definitions uh, involve, or the original definitions, things like quantum groups, uh, quantum field theories, sometimes actual physical theories of some sort, otherwise things looking like... Uh, physical quantum field theories, and they lead to invariants. But these are completely explicit functions or objects which are algebraic. And there are algorithms to compute them. And to me, this will just be a black box, uh, certainly in these lectures. So I will just inform you if the knot is called 4-1. Here is the quantum invariant. It's given by a formula that everyone can understand. And then you believe it comes from topology, but there will be no topology involved. OK, so that's just to to sort of orient us in this, uh, in this universe. 
So why do knots lead to number theory at all? They shouldn't. The whole point of topology is that you can move things around, you can budge them and move them continuously and push and pull, and the whole point of number theory is that you can't, that it's discrete, that it's rigid. So there are only countably many objects, say elements of a number field, even number fields, and so on. So the reason it works is uh, the famous theorem called Mostar rigidity, which says that a certain class called hyperbolic manifolds uh, cannot be deformed at all in dimension three. In dimension two, they absolutely can, but in dimension three, they're rigid. And this, combined with uh, more directly relevant for me, is Thurston's work, so his famous notes, I think, were 1983, where he realized that all of three-dimensional topology, in some sense, should be geometrized. And that was the famous problem that was one of the millennium problems, and that was solved, not just the Poincaré conjecture, but his vision that all three manifolds can be broken up roughly into pieces, each one of which belongs to one of eight geometries. And of those eight, one is much more rich and has many more than everybody else, and that is called hyperbolic three manifolds. So I will often use the word hyperbolic. I'm not going to say in great detail what it means, but just for the record, the examples I'll use in the talk will always be uh, these three, the 4, 1 knot, the figure 8, the 5, 2 knot, and the minus 2, 3, 7. So I, I won't necessarily always mention them, but those are where we've done most of our very extensive calculations. Sorry, not, excuse me, pretzel is that, hyperbolic. And this is kind of a baby knot. It's not hyperbolic. It's a, it's a so-called torus knot. So the theory I'm talking about is rather degenerate here. It's much easier. It still exists, but it's, it, it, you can work on everything. So you have this rigidity, and the way it works is this. If a, man, if a three manifold is hyperbolic, it means that it's the quotient of hyperbolic three space. So most of you, certainly all of you, have seen the hyperbolic two space, but it's usually modeled in the upper half plane with some nice geodesics that are semicircles. But this has constant curvature. I mean, there's a natural metric, and the curvature is minus 1. So it's saddle-shaped. It's curved inwards. And now you have a group of isom isometries, a discrete group of isometries. Just like for the two-plane, you might have SL2Z acting with the famous fundamental domain that I'm sure you've all seen. And so if you divide H3 by a group, which is sufficiently big, you will get a manifold which is either compact or maybe is slightly non-compact, but it's finite volume. And those are the ones we have. In our case, it won't be compact, because in the cases I'll be talking, this will always be S3 minus K. So it's, it's missing one cir circle at, at infinity, and that circle is the, is the knot. So we have these things. And because of rigidity, because this is a fixed curvature, it's got an absolutely well-defined metric structure. It means if I put my point, my fingers on two points, and ask three different mathematicians how far apart they are they, they will give him the same answer in centimeters. It's not topological, you don't deform, it's rigid, it's very precise. So the, the, the diameter of the thing, well, it's infinite if there's a cusp, but also the volume, which will be finite, is finite. And so that's our first connection to number theory, is that the volume of a hyperbolic three manifold, and in particular of a knot, one usually just puts vol of k, of course, the the knot has no volume, it's the complement. That means the volume of this thing, so you integrate the volume form dx dy dz over z cubed over this thing, and you get a number. And so Thurston, in the notes that I talked about in 1983, proved that these numbers have a wonderful property. The spectrum of volumes, so they're all positive real numbers. And there's the smallest one. There's the smallest volume. It's what's called the well-ordered set. So there's the smallest element, a second smallest, a third smallest, so below some point here, there are only finitely many, but then those have a first limit point. And this first limit point, if I draw pictures pretending it's two-dimensional, these would be closed manifolds, and this would be the first manifold that is a cusp. So it, it wanders off to infinity, and the metric structure is such that the cusp is very thin, so even though it's infinitely long, the volume remains finite. And then you can close up this cusp by what's called a Dane surgery and get countably many closed Manifolds, and those are the ones you see to its left. And then, however, there's a next one because it's well-ordered. After this, there's the smallest and the second smallest and another limit point. 
which again is one cusp. But then there's another limit point, and then there's the first limit point of limit points. That would be something with two cusps, et cetera, et cetera. And in the first paper that I wrote on this subject, which was uh, with Walter Neumann in 1985, and I'll come back to it next time because uh, not the part I'm talking about now, but what we had to do about the combinatorics plays a big role later. With Walter Neumann, we found how is the asymptotics as you approach one of these limit points, how many points are there, let's say, below a given point? So how, how quickly do they approach in the neighborhood of each cusp? And that turned out to be a question basically of pure anal analysis and number theory, that the topology somehow goes away. So these volumes have a structure, and I can make it very clear that there is a kind of a number theoretical structure by giving you the formula for the volume. So you have your three manifold, which for us later will be a not compact, but now it doesn't matter. And I'm going to triangulate it, but since it's three dimensional, they aren't actually triangles with tetrahedron. So you have a bunch of tetrahedron, and then you glue them together just like if you had a triangulated surface, you'd have adjacent triangles uh, somehow going around your surface. So you write it as a union of triangles, uh, but they're tetrahedron, so they have four vertices. And we assume that they're uh, ideal tetrahedron. You can, Thurston showed you can always do that. So each one has four vertices, and the vertices are in the boundary of this hyperbolic three space, which has been known since Lobachevsky to be the complex projective line. And it's been known since, I think, before the 19th century that if you have four points in the projective line, there's only one invariant because you can move the projective line by Mobius transformations, which would exactly be the isometries of H3. And you do that there's only one invariant. It gives, I shouldn't have called them PI, I should have called them PI. And then P1 up to P4 gives Z, which this is a formula I won't bother to write. I'm sure you've seen it, which is the cross ratio. And this is a complex number, different from 0 and 1. So each of these tetrahedron comes with a number. And now the first remarkable thing, so my manifold has been triangulated. It's the union, not, of course, disjoint. They, they meet along their sides, but their interiors are disjoint, of, let's say, N of these tetrahedra. But each of these tetrahedra, each of these symptoses is ideal. It goes off to infinity, so I should really draw it like this. It's it sort of the four corners go off to infinity. But it is a well-defined volume. And therefore, the volume of M, since the interiors are disjoint, is just the sum of the volumes. But now there's a formula. This, this whole tetrahedron is determined by just one number. So each delta i corresponds to a number, which is the cross ratio of its vertices. And the function is a famous function. dz is not done so gear, as you might think. It's a logarithm, uh, i from 1 to n. And so d, I'll write down the formula just so you see it's explicit. It essentially goes back to the 19th century, to Lobachevsky, although this version, uh, which is a much better one, is called the bloch wigner function. It's very much a 20th century thing. So d of z, but it doesn't matter. I'll write the formula, but... Don't worry about it. If z happens to be less than 1 in absolute value, then you take the dialogarithm function that Euler discovered, so the sum z to the n over n squared, and that function is many-valued. It converts in the unit disk, but if you move off the unit disk, wander around and come back, it'll have a different value. But what was found by Bloch, so Spencer Bloch and David Wigner, is that if you take the following combination, you add to the imaginary part of this function the log of the absolute value times the argument of 1 minus z, so theta, where you write this as re to the i theta, then this thing is one valued. Of course, it's real, because I took real numbers, but it's one valued, so it makes sense. And this function gives the volume of a single ideal tetrahedron. So you might say at this point, I haven't given you any number theory, because here we have a transcendental function. It's an infinite sum. And the z's are complex numbers. Z is, c is not number theory. C is analysis. But in fact, what's very beautiful and absolutely crucial for my whole story is that these numbers, these cross ratios, always belong to a certain field associated to the knot. So, there's, so that's a number field. Well, of course, there's a field. You just generate field with those numbers. I mean a number field, so a finite extension. And I can tell you what it is here. Uh, I'll take red again so that it's more, or maybe green. So the field here, so this is K. 
And here I'll put fk. So here there isn't really one in the sense of what I'm about to do because it's not hyperbolic. But here it's the field q of the square root of minus 3, which is the very simplest non-real field, non-real number field. There is smallest degree, smallest discriminant. This is the field q of xi, where xi cubed, I hope I get the signs right. If I don't, I'll, I'll check it in a second. This is the field, if you're a number theorist, you know that the simplest cubic field is, uh, pure, is uh, imaginary, and it has discriminant minus 23. That's this one. And here, the field is the same. So that's, in fact, why we chose that particular example, because certain phenomena we want to compare when you have so-called sister knots that share certain data. And in particular, these are sisters and they share, in particular, their associated number field. It's more or less the same as what's called the trace field, which is the trace you would get by adjoining to this gamma sits in SL2C. But it's only up to conjugation. But the elements in it have a well-defined trace because it's up to conjugation. And if you adjoin all those traces to Q, you will get a field called the number field. And this field is often the same and sometimes a little different, but it's essentially. But it's a number field. And I showed you what it is in these things. So by miracle, but it's because of this rigidity, by miracle, from something completely uh, flabby, the, the original knot that you can move things around, you suddenly have something that couldn't be more rigid than a number field with a given discriminant and a given, and I just checked it was a plus sign. OK, so that's already a beginning. So we already have a number field. But now this d of z is a transcendental function. But we know that sometimes some combination like this sum d of z i, it looks completely transcendental because this is a transcendental function. Even if I had z to the 1, z to the n over n to the 1, though to the ordinary logarithm, the logarithm of an algebraic number is not algebraic. So this is not algebraic at all. We don't expect it to be. We don't want it to be. But it turns out that sometimes the volume is the zeta function up to a factor which doesn't matter, some powers of pi and some rational numbers and so on. But it's essentially the value at s equals 2 of what's called the Dedekind zeta function. I'll just mention it, many of you know. And if you don't, it'll never come back. But every number field has a zeta function. If the number field is q, of course, it's the so-called Riemann zeta function due to Euler, and that we all know the sum 1 over n to the s. And this is the one that tells you how primes split in this number field. It's the key object of key interest in all of higher number theory, algebraic number theory. And its values at s equals 2 are always, actually, that's true for any field. The value at s equals 2 for any field is given in terms, essentially, of this dilogarithm function. So there is already very serious number theory, even at this level. And I can make it a little more serious, and I'd like to do that. So I'm going to introduce another frightening word in that I don't expect you to know these words. And I think I was told I can go as far to the left as I want, and the camera will somehow move. I hope it's true, and you'll be able to read what I write. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's nothing more wonderful than giving a lecture of this sort that's already technical and not live and being in really good hands. It is just an absolute miracle. So I have it here in Trieste, and I have it in Bonn, and I'm very grateful. So let me go on, but I want to say that associated to any field, but in particular to any number field, there's something absolutely frightening, which is called the block group which I'll say a few words about, but you don't really have to know what it is, only that it's out there. But there's something that is known to be essentially isomorphic to it, let's say after you tensor with Q. These are uh, abelian groups, and, and so defined I mean, you're over Z if you wish, so you can tensor with Q, get a Q vector space. And essentially, this is the same as K3. And if you think that's frightening, believe me, this is much worse. Algebraic K theory is a definition that it takes months to absorb, and I'm not sure anybody really has it deeply in their heart what algebraic K groups, higher ones, are really telling you. But whatever it is, this is something quite explicit. But an element of the block group of any field, there's uh, an element will have the following form. It's a formal, it's an integer, formal integer combination, integer combination of elements of f. But not every combination is allowed. It has to satisfy something very special. And so it has the form z1 up to zn, where each zi 
is in the number field f. Well, but if f, if k was my naught, and this was k gave this number field that I told you about, fk, which in the three examples was q of squared of minus 3, and then twice it was q. I shouldn't have used the same xi. Well, the heck with it. I'm old, and I can't change my habits. Elements of the block I always call xi, so it's not that xi. So associated to k is this uh, field. Associated to the field is this group. But associated to the knot is a particular element. And that element is simply the formal integer linear combination whose entries are exactly these cross ratios. And now I told you that not every combination of numbers in the field belongs to the block group. I'll tell you the exact condition, and then you can forget it. I won't really use it, but at least then you've seen the definition of the block group. So xi, now we're not talking about knots, just any old sum zi uh, belongs to bf, but I should warn you, bf is the elements I'm about to say, but modern and equivalence relations, so the representation may not be unique. There may be other zi's that you can use, and that's natural because, of course, if you have a manifold, you can triangulate it in many different ways, and so there are many different formal elements I could write, but there's a relation in the block group, and it's set up exactly in such a way that the moves that you go from one triangulation to the other in the triangulation are exactly the relations that define the block group. But I won't give the relation. They come from the functional equations of this dialogue. But I'll say what, what, when it belongs to the thing, if and only if, for all homomorphisms, phi and psi, from the field, from the multiplicative group of the field, so I ran out of space, so I'll go if this is illegal. So you take a map from f cross to z. For instance, if f was q, you might take the two adic valuation, the power of two, in your rational number. So positive or negative, depending whether two is the numerator or denominator. So these are homomorphisms. And the condition is that every time that you pick two of these things, if you take phi of zi and you take psi of zi, but you also take phi of 1 minus zi. So I didn't tell you, but if you permute these four points, it's the same tetrahedron, but the z will turn into something else, which might be, for instance, 1 minus z. So they both are kind of equally important. And so I take this 2 by 2 matrix, and I take its determinant. And the condition is that that should be 0. So it's a somewhat strange condition. It takes a lot of getting used to it. And if you haven't seen it, don't try to get used to it. It won't come back. But just that you've seen that this block group is a fancy gadget not nearly as fancy as algebraic K theory, but fancy enough. But it comes down to something quite explicit. So I'll give an example, and then you'll see. So example, which does come up for a certain three-manifold. It's not a complement. So sum M3 is going to give me the field, which will be Q of squared of minus 7. And then the Xi will be 2 times, I hope I remember it correctly by heart, it's 2 times... So there would be three tetrahedra. Two of them have cross ratio 1 plus square root of minus 7 over 2. And the other one, I think it's a plus sign, is minus 1 plus square root of minus 7 over 4. And if you, if you look at the, uh, if you compute the norms of these numbers and 1 minus these numbers, you find there are only 2s. And in this field, there are only 2 primes that divide the prime 2, P2 and P2 prime. And so you can only take the, two adic, the P2 adic valuation, the P2 prime adic valuation. So that's the only fine psi you can take. So there's only one condition. And you check that it works. So this is in the block group, whatever it is, of Q of squared of minus 7. And now if you take D of it, which means 2D of, I won't write it again, of that number plus D of this number, so 2D of 1 plus root minus 7 over 2, this is up to some easy constant, the value of the zeta function at s equals 2 of the field q of squared of minus 7. So I think, I hope this is the first section of, of, of the talk. I hope that that convinces you that we've gone from something that looked very flabby to something rigid, hyperbolic geometry, because of rigidity, and then to number, uh, really numbers, number fields, but much more than number fields, elements in those number fields that combine to give elements of the algebraic K theory or the uh, so-called block group and that sometimes, for instance, the volume will be something like a zeta function. So these volumes are absolutely numbers of arithmetic interest. In general, it's the so-called Borel regulator of K-theory. So that was the first of my examples.
So now I've uh, told you that. Now I want to talk, I told you that the real, the actual things I'll talk about are quantum invariants. So there are several. There's one called the WRT invariant, Witten, Resch, and Tich, uh, Turayev. I won't write it out because we won't use it. That's of a three manifold. And it's much more general than the one I'm talking about. I studied it many years ago in a paper with Ruth Lawrence, uh, which was, to me, the first introduction to these things and the connects with number theory. But that was a very, very easy three manifold, kind of a very far from being hyperbolic. And there are many, many people now, uh, in particular Sergei Gukov and the whole team of people around him and connected with my won't list them, there may be 15 names, doing for several years very exciting work and slowly developing a, a vision of how this thing should look. And it's very parallel to what we're finding on our side. I haven't yet, I said the name, but I didn't yet write it. Actually, it hasn't yet occurred, but I'll put it anyway. Stavros Garofalidis, Stavros, because he's my co-worker for everything, although, as I said, the joint work will come later. So we have these quantum invariants, and the work with him, this is the more important invariant, the WRT invariant, because it's generous for all three manifolds. But there's a very beautiful invariant called the Kashaev invariant. And the Kashaev invariant is something associated to a knot. And so in the original uh, way that it lives, you have the knot and the notation, I think, due to Kashaev, this is maybe 25, 30 years ago, is for each number n, which is, you know, 1, 2, 3, I'll always write as a to n for the standard nth root of unity. So on the unit circle, you take the, the nearest root of unity going counterclockwise from, from 1. So you go 1 nth of the circle. So this will be a number, and already you'll see now that we're talking uh, number theory, because this is a number not just in the field q of zeta, but even in the ring of integers, which for six atomic fields is just z of zeta n. So now we're in you know, full blast in number theory. So, but it's a collection, remember? So we have infinitely many numbers. It's a very strange invariant. But, but as I said before, it's completely computable. So even if you don't know any topology, which puts you more or less in the same boat as me, and you don't even care about all these knots, and you wouldn't know how to draw the figure eight uh, or the four two even if you were asked. But there's a black box. There are algorithms that are in the literature. People will give you the formula for the Kashaev invariant for any given knot. And once you have it, you can just study it. And then you can actually forget the topology, except you know that you're doing something of interest for topology, because the rest of what you do is algebraic. So let me actually write down what it is. I could write it down for 4, 5, 2 as well. So let me take this. If, if, uh, if k is the 4, 1, well, I don't have to write it called the k. I can just call it 4, 1. That's the point of having a notation. This is given by a very beautiful formula. So I'm going to use the following notation very often. If q is a number and x is another number, then what's called the q factorial or shifted factorial or q pochhammer symbol that has many names, it's the finite product is n factors 1 minus x times 1 minus qx up to 1 minus q to the n minus 1x. So in particular, qqn, which is what I'll mostly be using, then I'll just put, I think I'll just call it qn, because why? Well, that's the product 1 minus q up to 1 minus q to the n. You see it's like factorial, because if q is kind of 1 plus epsilon, then the ith factor is roughly i times epsilon, so the whole thing is epsilon to the n times n factorial. So this is the infinitesimal version of the quantum version of, uh, of factorials. It's called the quantum factorial. And so here the form is very beautiful. You take this uh, nth Pohammer symbol or shifted factorial, and then it's a complex number, so I can take, it's an algebraic number, but a particular complex number, I take its absolute value squared, and that's also an algebraic number, and of course it belongs to z of z to n, each one individually, because a complex number, the absolute value squared, is alpha times alpha bar, and they both belong to this, because z to n bar is z to n inverse. But now, where do you stop? Well, you don't stop, you go to infinity. But actually, as you can see, you only go to n minus one. Because as soon as little n equals capital N or is bigger, then in this product of n terms, let's say capital N is five, little n is seven, 
then this is 1 minus q to the 7, but on the way there was a 1 minus q to the 5, which vanishes. And once one factor is 0, the product is 0. So as soon as n exceeds capital N or is equal, then this thing is 0. And so it's actually a finite sum. And that's why not only the individual terms, but this whole you know, infinite sum is, uh, is in that. So this would be the Kashaif invariant. Now, OK. Now, the Kashaif invariant has absolutely wonderful properties. And actually, essentially, everything I'll be telling you, especially next time, will be uh, various. You know, it'll all start with that and a more general verse of the Kashaif invariant and their properties. But I want to tell you the, first the two most spectacular. So, uh, so properties of the Kashaif invariant. So property one. But we don't know if it's a property. It's a conjecture. This is it's a very famous conjecture. I was at a conference in Japan about five years ago called 25 Years of the Volumes of the Volume Conjecture. But it's still open. It's been set checked for a handful of knots, maybe 20 by now or 30. But a couple of years ago, it was only two. But it's, so it's a property that we know is true, but we don't know how to prove it. And the property is this, that if you take kn, that it will grow exponentially, like a certain constant in n, and in the exponent, little o of n. So it is exactly exponential growth. So its nth root will have a limit. And the wonderful conjecture, well, the name tells you all, is that up to a factor 2 pi, this is the volume of the knot, by which, as I already said, I mean the volume of S3 minus the knot, if it's hyperbolic. And I should be honest, the volume, as Thurston realized, is a real number, but it has an imaginary part, which is the so-called churn simons invariant. And that's not quite a real number. It's a real number multiplied over 4 pi squared. And so this number is slightly ambiguous. But if you change it by 2 pi squared, it's actually i times the volume. Then you'll get e to the 2 pi, and it's OK. So anyway, believe me, this makes sense. But for the 4, 1 naught, the volume is just 1.03 or whatever it is. And so you get a number, 2.03. No, sorry, the volume. Yeah, that's right. The volume of the 2, 3 naught is about 2.03. And then you divide by 2 pi. So let me give this to you so that to make it you know, much more uh, immediate and intuitive, let me give you a little table here. So if I take the values for 1, 2, 3, 4, then they're 1, 13, no, 1, 5, 13, and 27. And when I get to 6, it's 89. But when I get to 5, it's, if I remember correctly, I'll check in a second. Four, I better check right away because I don't remember. It's, uh, in fact, it, I had it written down. It's 46 plus 2 squared of 5. I didn't remember the multiple of squared of 5. So in general, as I already said, these numbers are algebraic numbers. But you see they're growing. And if I get to 100, then it's about 10 to the 16. It's growing exponentially in Kashaev's conjecture. It's an amazing conjecture, not because we care so much how these numbers grow. It's the answer. Like so often in mathematics, the problem becomes good because the answer is good. The answer is it's not just some stupid exponential, like it's always 2 to the n for every knot. No, it involves the volume. So the volume, which is, is a topological invariant by not to rigidity, but now you can read it off from the, uh, from the growth of the Kajayev invariant. So there's another property, which I'll come to in a second, which, in fact, that's my next theme, is that the Kashaev invariant belongs to what I'll, I'll just use an H. It's a wonderful thing that should be much better known in number theory. It's a purely number theoretical object, but many more topologists know it because it's been used a lot in knot theory and in three manifold theory. It hasn't yet really, I mean, I, some number theorists know it, but it's not well known. It's a gadget called the Habiero ring. And so each of the, for every knot, this Kashaev invariant will lie in that Habiero ring. So this is something, uh, again, a, a piece of pure number theory. And I'll show you how that works. So an element of the Habiero ring is, I'll call it a function, a, you know, a of q. But it's not a function in the usual sense, a function in the usual sense. You take q to be a number as an argument, and then you get a value. You cannot, in general, evaluate this function. So for instance, if you take a of pi, it will make no sense at all. However, a typical case would be this one. 
So for the 4-1 knot, this invariant I'll use is script J. For the 4-1 knot, this invariant is going to be the following. M goes from 0 to infinity. And then it's just what I wrote here, but I don't like to use complex conjugation because that's not an algebraic thing. So instead, I'll write out what that is. If you compute it, it's very a trivial calculation. So this formula that I just wrote here, this thing is simply J41 evaluated at the nth root of unity. And that's true for every knot. So we're going to have an element of the Habira ring. I haven't yet told you what the Habira ring is, but in such a way that if you evaluate it at an nth root of unity, the standard nth root of unity, you'll get exactly the original Kashaif invariant. So actually, that tells you what it is uniquely, because if you know this thing, then you know the values of this at roots of unity, but it's Galway invariant. It's defined completely with polynomials with, with rational coefficients, even integer coefficients. So you can just Galois conjugate. But every root of unity, if z is e to the 2 pi i alpha, every root of unity is e to the 2 pi alpha with alpha a rational number. And so there's a numerator over n. And then this zeta is Galois conjugate to the standard zeta n I took. And so you can automatically get the value at every q just by taking that formula and changing zeta to, for instance, zeta to the 17th, if 17 is prime to capital N. So there's a recipe to go back and forth. And so if you have an element of the Habira ring, and I can tell you very easily how it will look. So any element of the Habira ring will look like this. It's a sum, n from 0 to infinity. And then it's some polynomial in z of q and q inverse. So like in my example, it was minus 1 to the n, q to the minus n times n plus 1 over 2 times qn, and then times qn. So it's always got an expansion, not at all unique, but it can be expanded as an infinite sum of these uh, q factorials, these qn's. I shouldn't have put a line through that. That was unintentional. So it's got a sum, but the nth term is divisible by qn. So that means it will converge for the same reason I told you in the special case. If n is a sixth, uh, fifth root of unity, if, 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 sorry, if q is a fifth root of unity, then you can just stop the sum at 4, because you'll have a polynomial times 0. So these sums are always convergent. So although it's not a function in the usual sense, you cannot substitute for q an arbitrary complex number, but you can substitute roots of unity. OK, so this is the next piece of really exciting number theory. So we've already have a knot lead us to a number field, sometimes to dedicate zeta functions, but admit it to the block group and algebraic K theory. And now to this Habira ring. But now I can already start putting it together a little bit and showing you a little more. So let's take the simplest element. Uh, let me look at my notes if I'm forgetting something and also look at the time. My time is, of course, uh, moving along, but I've been told that always happens, whatever you do. Uh, oh, I see, I did leave out something that I absolutely wanted to say, which is on the volume conjecture. So, because that's absolutely crucial to our story. If I go back to the volume conjecture, then remember that uh, we have this invariant, so I gave the explicit formula, and it was supposed to be e to a certain constant, which is the volume over 2 pi times n. But then in the original volume conjecture, it's just you know, something sub-exponential. But there's a much more precise version uh, due originally to Gukov in this form. I think he was the first, I'm not sure, maybe also Garofalidis, various people, and then various calculations, including a paper I've with Gukov, Dimoft, and Lennels, uh, gave a more precise version. And the precise version is that it has an asymptotic expansion to all orders as the exponential we saw times n to the 3 halves times a power series, which of course depends on the knot. Well, so this would be for any knot. So there's a power series in 2 pi i over n. And this power series is supposed to have algebraic coefficients. That's why I put the 2 pi i just to get the algebraicity. So let me give an example. If I take the 4, 1 knot, uh, then five, I don't have to rewrite those factors. They're the same. 5, 4, 1 of h is the following power series. There's a prefactor, which is 1 over the fourth root of 3. 
But if you remember this, the field here was the cube squared of minus three. And you see that the square of this prefactor is up to power of i in that field, and that will always happen. The prefactor will always be an eighth root of unity times the square root of something in f, but who cares? But now comes the actual series, and these are the numbers I showed you before. One plus 11 times h over 72 squared of minus three, plus these are the numbers I wrote before, 1, 11, 697 halves, So in this case, it happens to be a power series with rational coefficients in H, but in general, it's not just Q bar of H, it's actually up to a prefactor, which here was the fourth root of three, it's actually coefficients in the same field F. So here the field remembers Q of squared of minus three, and you see that this whole power series is, does have coefficients in Q of squared of minus three. So now we're really honestly producing numbers serious numbers, it's much more than just this limiting value that gave the volume, which is anyway transcendental, and it's a metric invariant differential geometry. But this is now truly number theory. We have a prefactor which turns out very interesting, and then we have these further factors. And the same conjecturally happens for every node, and there are numerical methods that you can check this to very, very high precision, very far, find you know, dozens of coefficients. We know 280 for this knot, 200 for the 5-2 knot, and so on. So this can be done. Uh, to high, to high level. So that is important, but now comes, in a sense, the really beautiful fact, which is, uh, to me, most beautiful because, as I said, I love multiple forms. So this is, well, I won't start with the modularity. I'll come back to that in the middle. Let me talk about this uh, thing here. So we just had, to each knot, we had this function jk of q, where q is, uh, is a formal letter, but it will make sense if q is at a root of unity. So in particular, I can define another function, I'll use an ordinary j, not a script j, of alpha, which is simply jk of e to the 2 pi i alpha. So now it becomes a function on q. Now you could say it's a function on q mod z because it's periodic, but I don't want to do that. It's a function on all of q. And the reason that I want to do this is that we have my favorite group, the multiple group, which consists of two by two matrices, A, B, C, D, four rational integers with determinant one, and that acts on the upper half plane, as we all know, by fractional linear transformations, but it also acts on any complex number and also any real number the same way. And so I can took, if, if gamma is this element, then gamma of alpha is A alpha plus B over C alpha plus D, and so we have an action, and so that means that we have an action of SL2Z on this uh, domain space. So JK is now a function on Q. And so now what I wrote before uh, becomes the following statement, that JK of 1 over N, actually it's minus 1 over N in general, but for this knot it happens to be an even function, will be E to a constant times, uh, times N, times N to the 3 halves, times this power series that I told you, evaluated at 2 pi I over N. But actually, even here, there's already a little modularity. Because this is if n is, you know, a, a thousand, a thousand and one. So n is large, but it's going to infinity. If this is asymptotic, so n is big, but it's an integer. But let's say that n is going to infinity. I mean, I, t I found this on the computer many years ago, uh, 10 years ago, and published a paper called Quantum Multiple Forms. And so now let's say that I let n take the values 1,000 and 1 third, 1,000 and 1 and a third, 1,000 and 2 and a third. So I fix the imaginary part. Then when you do it on the computer to very high precision, you find that for these shifted ends, you have the same exponential gods, the same n to the three of the same power series to all orders. I did it to you know, 50 orders, 50 powers. But then you have a constant. And the constant in this particular case is 13. And the reason it's 13 is because that is this... Uh, this number, by what I've defined, is exactly the, this invariant evaluated at a third. Because remember, if alpha is a third, then q is e to the 2 pi over 3, which is the cube root of unity. It's a to 3. So this 13 is that. And so the full statement, maybe it's confusing to call it n because it looks like an inch, so I'll call it x. So as x goes to infinity with, say, a fixed denominator or a fixed rational part, then this function is exactly true to all orders. As it was before, nothing has changed, but up to a constant, and that constant is exactly the value of the same 
a function at x, but remember it's periodic, so that's why it's the same if I go to infinity through integers plus a third or integers plus any other fixed shift. So this absolutely looks like multidarity because if you know ordinary multiple forms, an ordinary multiple form on SL2z is a function that transforms nicely under the multiple group, but the multiple group is generated by only the translations, the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, and the inversion, the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0, which is f of minus 1 over tau. And if it's a multiple function, then it's equal. And if it's a multiple form, it's more or less equal. So there's a transformation equation that tells you that you only have to know what happens for tau plus 1 minus 1 over tau. Well, our j of x already is invariant under x plus 1 because it is a function of e to the 2 pi i x. x here could be alpha. But here we're saying that it has some behavior, but only asymptotically as x goes to infinity. So it's very hard to interpret this uh, in the sense you have to really get used to it. It took us a long time till we understood how these things work because we're actually taking a kind of a double limit, double scaling limit, the physicists might call it, in a double topology. X is going to infinity, so maybe I would make a graph. If I graph this thing as a function of X, it's very big because of the exponential function, let's say I graphed its log, it would have some local behavior, it would wobble around. But then after a while, this is 1,000, and this is 1,001, well, it goes up a bit because it's growing, that's the exponential factor, but it would be more or less the local behavior would be the same. So it's a combination of two factors. One is a smooth function where x is in r. It's just, it isn't, there's no arithmetic. It's just a real number going to infinity. This is some smooth function that would have some graph. And then you multiply it by solving this one, x, which was also in q, but therefore it's not just in r, it's also in q mod z. And then j of x is the number, which if x is a third would be 13, if it's a quarter would be 27, uh, 27 and so on. So you have this mixture of a purely arithmetic behavior depending on the fractional part of x and an asymptotic behavior depending on x as a large real number going to infinity. Well, that's all well and good. But as I just told you, the reason that number theorists like to talk about functions that are invariant or nearly invariant up to some factor under tau plus 1 and minus 1 over tau is not just a random love of inverting and translating, but because these two special matrices, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 0, minus 1, 1, 0, generate the group. So here, people really want to know what happens when you take a tau plus b over c tau plus d for anything. And then it will be roughly, up to a factor, f of tau. And of course, as I'm sure all of you, or certainly most of you have seen, if it's a so-called multiple form of weight k, the factor is c tau plus d to the k. But it's not important, it's something easy. You can relate f of tau with f of gamma tau. So when I did these experiments in, in 2010, I was looking now at j for my number field, uh, my not, ax plus b over cx plus d. So this is gamma of x. And gamma is some fixed element in SL2z. So a, b, c, and d are fixed. For instance, 0 minus 1, 1, 0 is the one I just did. And x is going to infinity exactly as before, that it both is going to infinity as a real number, but also modulo 1. It's kind of stabilized, and maybe it's just constant. It's always, you know, one-third modulo 1. Well, then the same thing happens everywhere. There's the product of a power series, which now depends. It's not always the same one I had before. It'll depend on the number a over c, so on the value at infinity. And so there'll still be some power series. And there'll again be an exponential factor that I won't write in a power of x that I won't write, so that part's the same. Here it's not 1 over x, it's just like usually in multilinearities. Well, I will put some of this, because remember we had n to the 3 halves. Now it's cx plus d to the 3 halves. But then there'll be an exponential factor with x that I'll drop. So it has the form. It looks, so this is, again, as a function, function of a large number x, but it's a real number going to infinity, but it's a real number. So this is a smooth function. This is some power series. And then, again, there's a part that depends on x modulo 1. And it's not just some function. It's always the very same function we start with. And that's why it's called modulo, because it's just like for a modular form. When you apply f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d, you get c tau plus d to a power called the weight. So here it would be 3 halves times f of tau. Here j of ax plus b over cx plus d is j of x times cx plus d the three halves, except it isn't. There's this huge factor which actually dominates this exponentially big factor, but it splits into two parts, the analytic part 
and the other. And that was a big mystery which will become very clear in the second lecture when I talk about matrix invariance. So here we have this. And now, I already gave you, if I take the 4, 1 mod, when A over C was 0, the original one, there was a prefactor, which remember was the fourth root of 3, and then it started 1 plus 11 times H plus etc. Well, H over 72 squared of minus 3, if I don't lie. But if I take, for instance, phi at a fifth, you can do all of these things numerically. Then you again get a prefactor times some a0 plus a1h with algebraic numbers. And so here, all the coefficients lay in the same. It's a power series in h, but all the coefficients are not just algebraic, but they all lie in that famous number field, which for this particular knot, this was the 4, 1 knot, happened to be q of squared of minus 3. But then there was a prefact which didn't look like that. Well, here it's much more beautiful. These ANs uh, all lie in FK, but you have to join that nth root of unity. That's sort of natural. So if n is 5, so in this case, you join the fifth root of unity. In general, you would join e to the 2 pi i a over c. So it's the cth root of unity, where c is the c of the matrix. So these numbers all line as an example. Uh, a0, I mean, they're quite complicated. A0 is a number of norm 29 in this example. And nobody knows, you know, it's just some random numbers. So you get very complicated coefficients. We know dozens of them by numerical calculations, which are, it's all done by numerical approximation, because none of this is actually proved. But now comes the interesting part. There's still, there's essentially the same prefactor. I may be lying, maybe factor squared of three. But then there's a new factor. And that factor is absolutely fascinating. I found it on the computer, and I had no idea what it was. It's, the f it's not in that number field. This epsilon is an element of f, which here is q of squared of minus 3, where you join z to n. So here, that would be actually q of squared of minus 3 and z to 5. But in general, you would adjoin fk and the root of unity. Epsilon is in that field, but you take the c root. So here, at, at fifth, we take the fifth root. And it's not just that. It's in the units of this. So this thing has now produced something that is kind of the holy grail in mathematics, except this doesn't solve the problem. So a big, not in mathematics, in, in algebraic number theory. In algebraic number theory, if you have a number field, it has associated to it a group of units. So for Q, the units are just plus or minus one, but for most fields, it's a group of some finite rank. You might add some more to Z plus Z plus a finite group, something like that. So you have this group, and it's impossible, except for a very special class of fields, like cytotomic fields or quadratic fields, it's essentially impossible to write down units. But here we're getting units actually coming out of topology. Here we've actually constructed a unit. And so the final discovery, so this was something that uh, was kind of guessed in discussions of me with Frank Caligari, and then uh, he saw how to do it. He's a very, very strong number theorist against uh, Stafford Skyrofalidis and myself. Uh, so it's a paper, I think it's on the archive in 2018, and it'll appear this year. I mean, it's, it's accepted in the annals of the IHES, of the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, I mean. So it turns out that there's always a unit like this, and this unit does not depend. So here we have an alpha, which in my case was a fifth. This alpha depends on, of course, alpha, because it, I mean, it has to. It's, it's in a field, which is you join alpha. But it does not depend on the knot. It turns out that was our conjecture, and we know now it's true. It actually only depends on this element I talked about, which was in this mysterious thing called the block group. So whatever it is, I don't want to go into details. But what we found is that you can associate to any element of the block group of any number field and to any rational number, a unit, which if alpha is his denominator in you know, a C, then this thing uh, is going to be the C root of a unit of F where you join e to the 2 pi i alpha. So for any rational number and any number field, uh, any rational number alpha, any number field F, and any element of its block group, you can have this. So that doesn't depend on knots at all. And that is what we did in this paper. And then what we have not proved is that this one is that one. Of course, it should be, because that's what motivated it. But we don't know how to prove that these things even exist. So for the knots, it's not true that we know it's this thing. But we know how to construct this thing for any, for any number field, any rational number, 
and any element of the block group. And when you do it for the number field coming from a knot, like q to the square root of minus 3, and the element coming from the block group, I didn't tell you what they were in our fields, in our examples. Let me just do two of them. So this is k and this is xi. Here it's just 2 times the sixth root of unity, which is in the field q to the square root of minus 3. And here, if I remember correctly, remember it was, there was a xi, a different xi. Uh, it doesn't matter, but just to say it's explicit. These are the shape parameters of the tetrahedron that if you add up d of this plus d of that, you'll get the volume. So these are the things in the block groups. It's completely explicit. And once you have that, there's a computer recipe given this thing to write down this unit, and that is the unit that we find. But that theorem of Caligari, Garofalidis, and myself is completely number theoretical. There's no reference to knots except for motivation. It's a general construction, but I don't think anybody could have guessed it. There was no reason to be looking for units associated to number fields and elements of their block groups. But the topology simply informed us that they exist. And then once we knew to look for it, well, you have to be quite brilliant, and that was Frank Aligari. We wouldn't have known where to look, but he saw, uh, in principle, how to construct it, and after a couple of years' work, uh, you know, everything worked. So this was really an application of topology to number theory. So I don't know, first of all, I don't know how long this lecture is meant to be. I was told there should be time for questions and answers, but I wasn't told if there should be time also for the lecturer. So, uh, so what I want to do next is at least show you a couple of pictures, and I had two small themes left to end today, and, but at least one of them I want to say. I've almost said it. So I told you already that J of x let's say for the 4 knot, and I'll just always stick to the figure 8 knot because it's the easiest. I told you that j of minus 1 over x is roughly j of x times something. So that means if you, this is exponentially big, but if you divide through, maybe it'll be a much better behaved function. So that's what I want to show you. So now I have to ask uh, Marco, who's the eminence Gris doing things, if he could show us the first slide. So he has to share the screen. So what you see there is a picture. So we have this function j of x. And remember that j of x is periodic. So whatever I show you, uh, it repeats when you get here. So for each number, and it's only defined at rational numbers, a half, a third, and so on. But when you graph it, you can't actually graph j of x because it's exponentially big. So the graph is actually log j of x. Otherwise, it would go up to you know, the moon. So what you see is a picture of this function. And you see it's not devoid of structure. Here you can see rational numbers, like here's a half. It's shooting up. The actual value of the half is down near the bottom of the screen. But nearby points near half are going off to infinity in some special way. And similar near 1, and then it repeats periodically. So it's a very mysterious function. But now you're seeing a picture of a typical element of the, uh, of the Habira ring, which here is the Kashaif invariant of the figure 8 knot. But it's completely mysterious. Nobody can see what's going on. But that was the function j of x. But now modularity tells us that at least it should become easier if you take the quotient j of x over j of minus 1 over x. And again, I take the log for the same reason. So now if we go to slide 2, which uh, Marco will click immediately. Marco, did you hear slide 2? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Here the graph is completely different. It's still not a smooth function. It jumps. But it, it only jumps and you know, it has little breaks. But it's a function. That function, if you take that graph and take the closure, you get a well-defined one-dimensional thing in R2. Whereas the one before, if you took its closure, you actually got the same set. Because it's a discrete set getting denser and denser as you go to infinity. So here you see the modularity in a visual way. This is not the new discovery that these lectures are about. It's the one of 10 years ago. This is a paper of mind quantum holomorphic, holomorphic modular forms. And it led to the thing that I'll talk next time, where this will become suddenly enlightening. Now it's still meant to be mysterious. So here's the picture. And just for fun, if we look now at slide 3, slide 3 is a blow-up of the, a small neighborhood of the point 3 8 So 3 8 is a kind of a typical point, rational, but with very small, denom small denominators. So it's a simple rational number. And now if you look at a small neighborhood blown up very much, what you see is that the function jumps. So the point in the middle is the value at 3 8 but the points above are the values just to the left and below is just to the right. And as you see, what you see is that the function indeed jumps. Don't worry about the value at 3 eighths, because later you, you actually emit it and you do something else. 
So what you see is a function that's actually C infinity in the limit, both to the left and to the right, as you approach any rational point. So here it's the rational point 3 8 And that will lead to a whole new class of functions that we need for the full paper called asymptotic functions near Q. So here, near Q is near rational points, near 3 8 This function is a well-defined asymptotic behavior, which means a well-defined Taylor series. So it's smooth to the right and another one to the left. This curve doesn't get quite there because I graphed you know, 1,000 points, but at some point, the denominator, if you get too close to 3 8 the denominator is too big, the computer stopped. But you, the curve, of course, would continue smoothly all the way to that point from above and below. So this was uh, one big surprise. And so now, uh, well, I kind of asked a question, but nobody answered. Maybe nobody has the right. Theoretically, I started at 4.30, but of course we didn't because I was introduced by several people. I think I've talked for an hour. Am I meant to stop, or can I take another five minutes, three minutes, 10 minutes? I have no idea what, what the organizers want, assuming at least one of them is still there. Take five minutes. Sorry, three yeah, yeah, I think it's fine to take five minutes. OK, so I just want to round this off. By the way, I don't need the slides anymore. Markov, at least not, not these. I'm going to want one more very, very soon. So what you see is that from this whole story, something really, to me, amazing has happened, that from knots, we already made the list somewhere, but I've removed it. We already from a knot, oh, here it is. We got a number field. We got the block group. We even have zeta functions, uh, in, although I didn't really talk about them. The block group, the Habir ring, but at the last part, we got units, uh, a, a construction of units related to elements of the block group. So a connection between two purely number theoretical things that now we know is very clearly connected. And I should say that in the continuation, what I'll talk about next time, all of this number theory goes much further. But this Habira ring will eventually get replaced. But we don't yet have a complete definition, or at least not a completely satisfactory one. There will be a new Habira ring for every number field, and in particular the ones I'm talking about here. And the classical one is the one for Q. But these are much more subtle. And an element of this Habera ring has a weight. In the case of Q, the weight was always zero. So it's a graded ring, and the weight will be an element of its block group. Q doesn't have a block group, but most fields have a non-trivial block group. And so all of this will be part of a new structure. And this will be is joint work we've been discussing a lot. We're far from writing anything up with still Stavros Garofalidis and Peter Schultz. So there's a very beautiful number theoretical story that's slowly emerging, which generalizes some of the number theory I've told. But I'll say even next time quite little. And for today, this is just a hint. But I want to end very briefly with the last topic, which is uh, the last thing I talked about here was my paper of 2010. So we're still a decade in, in back. And in the last 10 years, uh, together with mostly staffers, but also Lindy Moft and uh, Caligari and other people we've been looking, and also they've been working with groups. So there's kind of a group working on this whole complex of ideas. But in particular with Garth Lees, what we now found is a new picture. So the final picture that I'll talk about next time uh, sudden, suddenly makes this completely mysterious thing equally mysterious because you don't know why it's true, but at least you know what is supposed to be true. So this is, once again, with Stavros and myself, and somehow, let's say, over the last five years, roughly. The paper is now, by the way, for those of you who want literature, I gave a course about this, partly in this room, a few months ago. And it's uh, most of the, I think the recording's not always good quality. There were some problems. And lecture notes on many of the lectures are online on the MPI website. And also, the big paper Stavros will be ready well, for, for our friends within a few days, and then on the archive, I hope within you know, two weeks or something, we've finished it, but it's an, you know, it's an over 90-page paper. It's a long story. So if you want more details than I'm telling here, you might have to wait a few days or look at the MPI website. But the final thing is this. To each knot, we had already this Kashaif invariant, which had two versions. Remember, it was j of x. Well, alpha, I call, let's call it x again. This was a rational number, which was also script j of e to the 2 pi i x. Uh, so that's a, a root of unity. And script j is, in, this, in the simplest case, in the Habira ring. But in fact, they won't be. They'll be in these more general Habira rings. So the original picture was this. But the new picture is that actually, so this was the original and absolutely beautiful, uh, it's one of the most wonderful invariants, uh, certainly in topology, but maybe anyway, the Kashaif invariant. 
But actually, we have a whole matrix. And the size of the matrix is r plus 1 by r plus 1, where r is usually the degree of that number field. But I actually lied to you a little. That field is a field. And remember from my three favorite examples, uh, uh, 2, 3, 7, I told you that it was q of square root of minus 3, so the degree was, so r here is 2. Here it was q of xi, which was a cubic field. And here I told you that the original field is also q of xi, but actually when you do the full calculation, there's a second field, which in this case is q of cosine 2 pi over 7, which is a cubic field, so it's actually 3 plus 3. So r is actually 6 in this case. And then actually, the story is even slightly bigger. There's a there's always another factor. These are labeled by the so-called connections. And there's the trivial connection. And that always gives you field Q. So if you take the 3, 1 knot, which, remember, wasn't hyperbolic, R will be 0. But R plus 1 is non-zero. You still have Q. So the total size of this algebra here is 1 plus 3 plus 3. It's 7. So it's always R plus 1. We live in R plus 1 matrix. And that matrix, I'll just write down how it looks for 4, 1. And then I'll stop. And I'll be very approximate. So this matrix, we still call it uh, J, but we underline it. Well, in tech, it's boldface. It's now a matrix value thing. And again, it's labeled by K and by alpha. But I'll just do it for alpha. So I'll, I'll do it just for the 4, 1, not in 0. So then this matrix is going to be a function of, let's not even worry too much what it's a function of. It's going to be a 3 by 3 matrix. But the first column for every matrix is 1, 0, 0, 0. So this thing will actually have block triangular form. For every knot, it will be a 1 and, a, and then zeros, then something here, and then something here. So here, r is just 2. So here, this corresponds to q. And here, this corresponds to q. This corresponds to q of square root of minus 3. And this corresponds, if you'll let me say that, to q of square root of minus 3. It's the same abstract number field, but differently embedded in the complex numbers. And the same this way. But it's a, the matrix is not at all symmetric, but the labeling is symmetric. It's given by these so-called flat parabolic connections. So minus the square root of minus 3, whatever that means. So here, I'm going to have this Habero element. So remember, I told you that for the, that for the 4, 1 knot, if I took the Habero element and didn't compute it at roots of unity, but instead near 1, maybe I didn't tell you that. If you computed it e to the h, where h is infinitesimal, then for the same reason that the nth coefficient has that nth Pockheimer symbol, so it's n terms, 1 minus x, 1, 1 minus q, 1 minus q squared, it'll be divisible by h to the n. So if the nth term is divisible by h to the n, the whole thing makes sense. It's a power series. And I think I did write it down. At least I wrote down the numbers. It happened to be this particular power series for this particular knot. That it's even as a fluke, it's because it's its own mirror image. If it weren't, it wouldn't be. OK, so here I'll have this 1 minus h squared plus etc. And here I'll have something similar. So this one is in the Habira ring, but it's the element of the Habira ring evaluated. The element of the Habira ring, you can evaluate it at roots of unity, but you can also evaluate infinitesimally near roots of unity, for instance, one or any other root of unity. So then you get this. So this is also something else in the Habir ring with an equally explicit formula that I won't bother to write down. Here, we'll have the series that I started with, the phi zero of h. Maybe you remember the phi zero of h was the one that had the 11 h over 72 squared of minus 3 plus 697 halves times h over 72 squared of minus 3 squared, and so on. So three of the, uh, the functions we saw already, both of them occur here, but there are different positions of the matrix before they played wildly different roles. And it happens that the third one usually be something else, but this not, as I said, it's its own mirror image. And so when you go to the complex conjugate here, you just change h to minus h. And similarly, there's a similar, let's call it psi zero of h, with similar coefficients. It starts 1, this I think is 7. 37, I've forgotten, and some other number over 2. It's, it's exactly the same sort. So what you get is a whole matrix. And you might say, well, so what? Everybody can generalize. We had one invariant. But actually, we had two. We had this power series, the Habira ring one, and this infinite power series, which were mysteriously linked. But now I can show you, and then comes the clue in the fast final slide, and I'll stop. Remember before, what we did is we took j of gamma x, and we divided by j of x. So for instance, I took j of minus 1 of rex, and I divided by j of rex. 
And what had been a whole cloud of functions suddenly became, but it wasn't a very nice function, but at least it was a, a function of a real number. Now I do the same. But now there's a big difference. When you have a matrix, you can divide one matrix by the other. So for instance, I could take this whole matrix, this 3 by 3 matrix, and take it at minus 1 over x and divide it. Uh, well, I, you can't put slash because they're matrices. So you have to decide on the order. You would divide j of x on the left, let's say, by j of minus 1 over x. And so now, that was the picture before when you only took one single component of the thing, and then it was all messed up. This was the original j. But now, could I have slide 4, and then I'll finish. Uh, slide four. Slide four. There we go. These are the six components. Well, a three by three matrix, you'll tell me, should have nine. But if you, in, if you divide two matrices in block form, it's still in block form. So three of the components are one and zero. I didn't graph them because we know what they look like. But the other six, Stavros graph, and as you can see, suddenly they've all become smooth functions. And in fact, we actually know that they're real analytic functions with a well-defined holomorphic continuation. And so that will be the story next time. These functions actually become holomorphic functions. They leak from the real life, first from the rational numbers, which is where they were defined, into the reals, and then from the reals into the upper and lower half planes, and they acquire some sort of modularity properties. And that will be the the main theme, well, that is the theme of the second lecture. So this at least gives you a foretaste of things to come. And I'm sorry that I went on a little bit, but I usually go on even more. OK, so thank you for now, and I hope there will be questions. Are there any questions for the speaker? Uh, I have one question, Professor Sagier. So in your lecture, uh, uh, Speaking? You see the unity of mathematics. Can you hear? I can hear, but Hello? I can't see. Can you put on your camera? Just for fun. Oh, I don't know yeah, who's... I, I, I have it. I'm uh, from Mexico, coming from Mexico. Okay, now I can see you. Thank you. I, couldn't, I didn't know who it was, and I couldn't see you. Thank you. Okay. So, so, I mean, in your beautiful lecture, you see the unity of mathematics, uh, not theory, algebraic topology, case theory, etc. But I think... One ingredient that you could have measured is dynamical systems because uh, uh, the volume of the hyperbolic manifolds is also given by, uh, by a theorem of yours, is given by uh, ergodic theory, by the horocyclic and geodesic flows. A and, theorem of uh, mine? Ah, I know what theorem you mean, but that's for SL2Z. Yeah. That's two dimensional. Yeah, yeah, this is three dimensional. But, yeah. actu but, actu but actually, it can be generalized to P PSL2. Uh, can be applied for the, for the, for the case of the figure eight knot uh, uh, also. Uh, so, uh, you could add, uh, my, my only comment is that you could have added dynamic assistance in the list that you gave. That's all. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> about it. So, I hope that at some point you will send me an email and say a bit more. Obviously, I didn't talk about it because I didn't know, and it's not part of this complex of ideas. It's meant to be connected and not just loose things. But that's absolutely fascinating. It sounds very convincing that there will be a, really an interesting connection. And I hope, I certainly won't work on it because I already don't know topology, but I know dynamical systems much less. But there are other people who do, and I hope somebody will be inspired. So thank you very much. That was a beautiful uh, comment and addition. Thank you. Now no one else will dare ask a question because you've set the bar too high. <laughs> Any other questions for Professor Sagier? So don't be shy. Uh, Don, I have a question. On the, this is Samir, hello, can you see me? I recognize your voice anyway, but I can even see yeah. you. On the, on the blackboard to the extreme right, there's a modular type equation for J? Yeah. Is that supposed to be an equality or an asymptotic symbol? Oh, sorry. This, of course, is complete nonsense. It's, of course, asymptotic equality. What I mean is, and it's, I mean, in the paper, we write out this same mantra 500 times. So I think we had a tech macro. As x tends to infinity through rational numbers, so it's not on the reals, through rational numbers. And now you can put the last part in two different ways. 
and I said them both, but very quickly, everything I say is very quick, with bounded denominator. Or you can say with fixed fractional part. Because fixed fractional part would mean, as I said, you might take a thousand and a third, a thousand and one and a third, and so on. So you just go up in steps of one, and then you'll get this asymptotically to all orders. Of course, it's not an equality. These aren't exact functions. That couldn't possibly be. They're all in different number fields and so on. But it's all orders. But whether I say that I fix the fractional part exactly and say it's a third, or say it's bounded denominator, let's say it's denominator at most five, well, then there are only five denominators. And if it's denominator three, there are only two numbers, a third and two thirds. And so I define it, then it's the same. So there's this double topology that I mentioned. X is going to infinity as a real number. And so half of the formula, the CX plus D to the 3 halves, the E to a constant times X, and the power series in 1 over roughly CO, CX plus D, that part is a completely smooth function that you could draw a graph. And if you drew a graph of that, it would be exponentially big. It would be completely smooth. And then you would multiply that by a, a periodic function. So something that oscillates, but whatever it does, it's the same in every group of size one, except it's not a smooth function. It's the cloud that you saw before. So if I actually draw a graph, you would see the cloud. But when I divide one by the other, then that turns into the graph that had this behavior. So thank you very much. That was simply a, a mistake. Of course, it's not equality. It's, of course, asymptotic. But it's only not as x goes to infinity in some rational way. If you take uh, you know, 1,000 times pi, you will get nonsense. It has to be either an integer or an integer by a fixed rational shift or a bounded denominator rational shift. So now you people have two choices. They can have a brand new idea, or they can point out a mistake. Uh, any other questions? Well, uh, uh, of course, we'll have a second chance to ask uh, during the second lecture on Friday. And uh, we would like to thank you very much, all of you, for attending in person and, and also connecting. And uh, let's thank Professor Sagier again for his very nice lecture. This chance. Thank you very much. Hello? Ah, hello. Ah, hello, Don. Uh, uh, I wasn't really connected. Uh, my mic wasn't working. I had, I had a question, actually. You have you, a question, Maxime. yeah. I yeah. can see who yeah. it is, and yeah. I can yeah. hear who it is. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, uh, about maybe s seven, eight years ago, with Herbert Gangel, we also, using from uh, elements of block roots, extract some roots in some number fields. I, I don't remember that we had units. Uh, are you aware of this? Actually, we never wrote it. I mean, maybe we talk. This little paper that you wrote with Herbert, he's told me about it several times. Right now, I, can't, I think it's very related. This is to do with the so-called cyclic dial logarithm. Yes, and yes. If, if I had taken five minutes, I've often given a lecture on this story with units, the whole lecture is about those units. Then I certainly would speak about the cyclic dial logarithm, and I would have mentioned your joint, pa your joint I think, never published paper with him, and yeah. to, but today I simply skipped it. I said there is a beautiful story with the unit, and all I said is you can associate it with the element of the block group. But indeed, that's true, and it's absolutely connected. Your story didn't go, I think, nearly as far in that you had the yeah. cyclic dialogue with them and its properties. But what I think you didn't have is that if you take certain combinations of those cyclic yeah. diagrams that are associated to elements of the block groups, that a miracle happens and you get units in a cyclotomic extension of, of your original number field. Yeah, that's, that's a problem of, we don't have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. was the discovery. And I don't see how anybody could have discovered that by pure thought. I don't see how you would ever expect it. We didn't do it by pure thought. Uh, it came out of the cal numerical calculations. You had these numbers. I mean, I found that in my paper of 2010. That number that I told you, the fifth root, I had to calculate 300 digits of it by numerical interpolation and then identified as an algebraic number. And actually, it wasn't even the fifth root. It was in a tenth root because I was in a, in a smaller field. I have finally identified it as the product of a prime of norm 29 with the tenth root of a unit 
in the real part of the 15th Roots of Unity. And it was like completely miraculous. I had no idea why that was happening. And then we worked for several years to understand where are those units coming from. So it's, that's the really subtle part of the story. But indeed, the main ingredient on the way is the cyclic dialogue rhythm, which I could write down, I won't. Yeah. And it's essential, I can say in one word for the audience, we have the Pockhammer symbol, one minus Q, one minus Q squared, and so on, or one minus X, one minus Q, X. And if you put instead one minus Q, one minus Q squared, squared, one minus Q cubed, cubed, and so on, then you get the, this corresponding thing that's the analog, not of the log, but of the dialogue. And this is the function that actually several people have found in various guises, and in particular Herbert Gangel and Maxime Konsevich. So indeed, that's I think true. Wojt Wojt Kavak maybe. Was Sorry? Wojt Kavak, I think, was even before. Wojt Kavak, I think he discovered this earlier. I still didn't catch the name. Wojt Kavak. That I don't remember. That I didn't even know, in fact. I know yeah, yeah, many of yeah. these things, I didn't know that. But anyway, we're getting now too technical because we're talking about a okay, thing yeah. that wasn't actually in the talk. I didn't mention the cyclic dialogue them at all. I've, I mean, I told way too much, but I assure you, I skipped a lot more than I, I told. I mean, it's, as I told you, it's a 90-page paper. I'm just giving little glimpses of little pieces. So... John, maybe I could ask you whether this lecture was recorded. So unfortunately, I came in late. In fact, I only saw the last two minutes of your talk. Yes, so to is my there somewhere one can. See? Yes, to my delight, it, it, it is recorded. It be, uh, yes, at the inter side, I'm sure. I see. Excellent. It okay. will be. Yeah, you know, many people have asked me that, and I'm very happy. Usually, I don't like letters being recorded because it reminds me what a mess I made. But I mean, one's responsible for the mess one makes. But the fact is, people can't always come. It might be three in the morning where they are. So I'm very happy this lecture was recorded. And the second one, of course, yeah, also will be. Driving right now. So uh, yes. <laughs> so it would be great to have a link to the Yeah, it's recording. nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> you don't often see Vikings drive. Nice to see you too, Don. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So yeah, but uh, okay, I, I will look forward to finding the link and then I will join for the talk on next uh, Friday. So thanks. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? People seem to be uh, thawing. As, as it's turned off, then they suddenly realize they have a question. Any additional questions? No, it seems not. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for such a nice lecture. And we'll see uh, everyone on Friday for the second we'll part. All again on Friday. Well, lecture. I don't know all those who survived. See you on Friday. <laughs> see you on Friday.